to the light gate. Uh, we have a really great show for you tonight. We have somebody who is world famous and, uh, oh, I can't wait for you to meet her. We are coming to you live from the city of New Orleans in Louisiana. Hold on a second. Stupid phone. And uh, at 107.7 FM with the United Public Radio Network. We're also coming to you from UFO Paranormal Radio Network at 105.3. We're on Roku, Facebook. Uh, Tumblr, YouTube, and a whole bunch of other platforms. And I'm so excited. So go, Preston. Hi. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Dolly. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on The Light Gate. This is episode 21. I'm super excited. I'm your host, Preston Dennett, UFO researcher and author. And my lovely co-host is Dolly Safran, the contact dean, the subject of my book, Symmetry. And we have a wonderful guest tonight. So I'm going to dive into it pretty quick. I just want to say a quick hi to all of you wonderful people. W. Decker, thank you so much for the super chat. Super chats are always appreciated. And namaste, thank you very much. Namaste, namaste. <laughs> Hello, Robert. Alan Yaffe, thanks for joining us. There's Louise and so many of familiar names here. Raul Melendez. Oh, thank you very much. I very much appreciate the super chats. Very, very kind of you. Hello, Tools. Who else do we have here? Nancy Thames. Yay. Here's Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Christopher Harmon. I got in trouble for naming too many um, people in the chat and it's taking up too much time. Well, not trouble, but <laughs> um, we really do want to get to the show as soon as possible. So I'm just going to breeze through it. Just want to say hi, Mary and Starletta and Real Badger. Dana Matthews. Hello. Hector Gonzalez, Terry D, awesome to see all of you. Janice Conant, Salvador Soto, and Rad Peanut. Rad Peanuts gave us three hearts. Thank you, Rad Peanut. <laughs> Dave Jenkins, Adam Robbins, uh, awesome to see all you familiar faces. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. And we have a really wonderful guest, someone I've known for decades someone very prominent in this field, one of the most influential UFO researchers in this field, hands down. She is a hypnotherapist, and there's only maybe five or 10 people who are at her level. You know, Leo Sprinkle, Bud Hopkins, John Mack, David Jacobs, Barbara Lamb, and of course, Yvonne Smith. So tonight we are very happy to welcome Yvonne Smith, a researcher, presenter, hypnotherapist, and author. She is a clinical hypnotherapist. In fact, in 1992, Yvonne founded the Close Encounter Resource Organization, CIRO. This is a post-traumatic stress support group for individuals and families having trauma experiences. And it's been active for 31 years now. Wow, congratulations and is recognized nationally and internationally by TV and radio. So Yvonne became interested in victims of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, way back in the late 1980s. And in 1990, after two years of study and 1,000 hours of internship at the California Hypnosis Motivational Institute, the only credited college of hypnotherapy in the U.S., she received her hypnotherapy certification. So she's for real. She's specializing in PTSD disorder cases and uses her skills to assist such victims to work through their anxiety, which many of her subjects refer to her by physicians and psychiatrists. So these include all kinds of people, doctors, military personnel, pilots, professors, all kinds of people including people in the military or people who went through traumatic early life situations and all kinds of you know situations so let's see what else do we got going on here in her bio um, it's quite long but it's in the uh, description so if you want to learn more about her they're certainly there i will say that uh, she has co-lectured on tour with dr john mack super well-known head of Harvard's University Psychiatry oh. Department. She's also lectured at um, from South 
Preston, you're breaking up. Uh-oh. Well, <laughs> hold on. We are now being hit by very, very hard CME, just so everybody knows. it was uh, We were doomed to have it hit just as nightfall fell in the U.S., and it is now hitting our systems. Hold on a minute. Let's see if he comes back. Preston, the CME's hit. Okay, well. And you're popping off. What do you want to do? <laughs> I'm, I'm here. You're going very rapidly. Okay. Um, just so y'all know, Preston and I are in the same house, and I'm going to, he's either going to recycle and try to come back in, or I'm going to tell him to come back here. I have my own office, and he has his own place. So, yeah, <laughs> this is going to be so much fun. I'm going to go ahead and bring in Yvonne Smith. Hi, Yvonne. Welcome Hi, to the How are you? <laughs> I'm pretty good. Um, I knew a CME was coming. He's got a system we're replacing right now. And uh, I knew it might be iffy if, if we got hit by it. And we definitely aren't. It is happening. Uh, so I'm just going to start things off. Please, please tell us how this all started for you. And if you had any experience as a child, I'd love to hear about those first. Um, it just, oh gosh, um, everybody asks me about how it all started. And that's always been such a, a difficult question because it's not something that I planned. Um, right. yeah. I had a totally, totally different life than what I have now. Um, but in the late 80s, my mother, um, who was, you know, very psychic and she was all, she loved the paranormal and, um, and all of that. And, you know, she, and I was not into that when, you know, when I was younger, I mean, so she would read her horoscope and all that. Well, in the late eighties, I, of course I was married and had my children and she wanted to know if I wanted to go to a whole life expo with her, which was close uh -huh. to where we lived in Pasadena, California. And because oh, wow. she never drove. And so, okay. um, you know, in her day, in her generation, it was always the husbands who drove. So, so she yeah, never yeah. did. So I drove her and myself. We went to the Whole Life Expo, and that's where um, I met Bud Hopkins for the first time. When I read the description, you know, my mother knew who he was, but I didn't know who he was really. I mean, I, I think she'd mentioned him, and but I, I read uh, his bio on the program. Mm -hmm. So we went and sat at his lecture, and I was. I was really riveted by what he was saying. I mean, uh, I never reacted like that before watching any of any speakers. And afterwards, um, we stood in line to ask him a couple of questions. I introduced myself and my mother. And, and then from there, um, I just became, I don't know if you want to say obsessed, which is really strange for me because I never get obsessed over anything. You know, I usually, I usually get bored first. But okay. in this situation, I wanted to read, I read, I read his books, of course, uh, first thing. And then I wanted to read as much as I could about the subject. And, um, and I, I, when, as I read these books, especially Bud's books, you know, he was talking about using hypnosis regression to mm -hmm. uh, uncover these buried memories that people have um over well through traumatic experiences okay so i then that took me to looking into hypnotherapy colleges and at that time there weren't many at all but i was so fortunate to have a uh accredited hypnotherapy college as as preston had mentioned in the San Fernando Valley. And that was only maybe 45 minutes from where I live. Wow. So I wow. took the entire course and uh, became certified, worked in the clinic to gain all of my necessary hours before I got certified and wow. um, got my certificate. And, and ever since then, I mean, um, 32 years later, I'm, I'm still doing this. And, at that time, you know, I, I never really looked ahead where 
you know, what would I be doing this years from now? Never yeah. thought about um, writing a book. Never really thought about lecturing. Mm -hmm. um, all I did was wanted to get my certification so I could work with possible abduction cases. But at that time, I was really wanting to work with uh, cancer patients uh, initially because I had a very close uncle who died at a very young age at 41 of cancer. Oh, and I was with them every day. And I thought, oh, my God, if I only had this knowledge and training, I could have helped him cross over. So that was really what I wanted to do. And then as I, I began attending conferences, UFO conferences, I met other researchers. And it just from there, it just um, it, it snowballed. You know, I thought I would have a few abduction cases and, and mainly cancer patients, but it was totally the other way around. And now um, for the last several years, I have, you know, specialized in this work. Wow. And of course, written books and lectured everywhere. And so I feel, I really feel that uh, I was placed in this path. Um, I was directed to do this. I, I couldn't say that years ago because it sounded so woo woo, you know, it's like, you're going to think I'm crazy, yeah. but it just, um, I, I really feel that now very strongly that, um, I was placed to, you know, to do this because doors opened up for me, uh, where I never knocked on anyone's door and asked to be interviewed or, or, you know, asked to be a speaker. It just opened up. And that's when I knew, um, I was, it was one, one day, I was going to one of the conferences where I lectured with uh, Dr. John Mack and Bud and David. I was on the plane. I forget where I was going, somewhere back east. And it was like a light bulb went on. And I just thought, oh, my God, I think I know why I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to educate people about this. And I'm supposed to help people uh, through this. And it almost just came to me on the airplane <laughs> so you know i just then followed my path uh and I, I continue to do it so um i'll be doing this until i can't do this anymore you know i'm not getting any younger <laughs> no none of us are well, you know i'm sorry i had some technical difficulties there so your bio got a little glad bit you're back. glad <laughs> you're back Kristen. So, so sorry about that yeah i'm getting a new computer i just need to get the camera set up so it's partly I mean, it is my fault. My memory is filled up on this computer. Mm. So I missed a little bit. I wondered, did you, you know, because I always wonder about this. When you were growing up, did you believe in UFOs? Had you had UFO experiences? Was this something you were interested in? You know, um, I don't remember anything as a child uh, UFO related, like I hear from all of my clients. But my mother, and I had explained to Dolly, my mom was always you know, she was psychic. She was into the paranormal. She would always read her uh, horoscope. And um, she would, she would tell me, uh, but later, later in years, not ever, not when I was real young, that she would lay down on my grandmother's rooftop mm -hmm. at night and stare at the stars and always yeah. wonder, you know, what's out there and kind of long to be there. Um, and when, you know, when she told me that, I said, oh, my God, yeah, you know, I never realized I hear that from some of my clients that they feel homesick. You know, they, they want to go home. So um, she she had I know she had some contact. It was um, she she never mentioned seeing a phone, but I know she had some experiences with some entities. And it wasn't until I was in my 30s and when I started um, looking into this and, and first getting into the field that I started experiencing um, well, we had paranormal activity in our home and paranormal and UFO contact, they go hand in hand. I mean, almost everybody has both. Um, my sons, especially my youngest son, had experiences starting at five years old um he would tell me somebody came into his room you know a tall spider i i lectured about this you know over at uh 
in Roswell and Lately and in at the MUFON Symposium. And I was just, I thought, oh my God, you know, this is happening to him. Um, but you know, what came first, you know, the chicken or the egg? I mean, I got into this with the already, you know, having the experiences and it, it just, but it, it, it was, just, I meant to, I was meant to do this. And um, I think the, the course of my path, I don't think I could have changed it. Um, but I had, you know, I had a totally different life before um, working for the Los Angeles Superior Court, you know, for many years. I was married to a lawyer, had a very, you know, corporate life and, um, you know, I had my two boys. And now, I'm, you know, this is what I'm doing. Um, I have my own practice as hypnotherapist working with abduction case. So um, I know that, of course, I have been affected. I've had experiences, um, not ongoing, but I've had some strange things. And in fact, Bud one time uh, tried to hypnotize me a couple times. And it was very, very vague. And we couldn't really work together that much because he was in New York, you know, and, and I'm in Southern California. So it was difficult. And we didn't have Zoom at the time. We didn't have any of that, you know, Skype. So everything had to be done in person. But um, I learned, learned a lot from my clients as, as they're sharing their lifelong experiences and of course their family because it's a, a fa I call it a family affair. There is definite a family connection with this. Um, so, you know, I, I've learned so much from them and, uh, and then starting Close Encounter Resource Organization, Zero, 31 years ago, I did that because as, as people were leaving my office and calling me and at that time, um, we all we did, you know, we had phone calls. I mean, when the researchers and I wanted to ask each other a question or network, it was phone calls. And we lived throughout the United States, so our phone bills were tremendous. And, um, oh gosh, I just lost my train of, train of thought. What was I saying? Okay, see, senior moment. Um, okay. <laughs> Question comments on the screen. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to try to, <laughs> but, oh gosh, You're I, talking about your clients oh, and the new organization you put. Yeah. The reason I started Zero is because they were calling me all the time. You know, they didn't have anyone else to talk to. Many times they couldn't talk to a spouse or a family member. Oh my God, certainly not a co worker. Mm -hmm. And of course that didn't go over real well with my marriage. You know, if I was on the phone, you know, I could have been on the phone 24 hours a day. There was no email back then. So I decided it was about five, six of us. And I said, I think, I think I want to put together a support group. We were in my living room. We talked about, it. I think we should name it. And um, ever since then, I mean, I never knew it was going to be around for 31 years. We have two locations where we meet because we have, people coming in from different areas. We meet once a month. And then of course, during COVID, uh, um, as many of us had experienced that we needed to reinvent ourselves. You know, we were all under quarantine. I couldn't, my office closed, you know, we, my partner and I closed the office, we had to. Um, so I started the Zoom, I call it out of state series meetings for out-of-state members because uh, we have many out-of-state members and over, of course in, uh, around the world. I started that for um, for, the, for people that couldn't come to our in-person meetings. So I continue it now even though none of us have to be in quarantine anymore. I felt bad. I thought, oh my god, I can't just stop these meetings because then the people that are you know, out of state and, and in other parts of the world they're not they don't have advantage of coming to the meeting so i do those zero meetings on zoom uh every third sunday of the month and i do i host the in-person meetings every fourth sunday of the month wow um, and they're private though you're not going to find them on the internet because uh the only way to provide a safe haven for people who want to share right. their experiences is to have it private 
Uh, right. We keep our locations private. And it's by invitation only. And right. 31 years, so far, so good. It's worked. You know, so <laughs> here I am. <laughs> well, I've talked to a lot of people who you've helped, and they're all very, very grateful. You're having oh, a huge, yeah, huge effect on this field. So I am wondering about this because certainly I've gotten indications of it. Gosh, I've got a million different directions I want to go to. Um, but yeah, I wonder what you think about the ETs and do you think they're aware of your work or have you ever gotten any indication of that? Oh, they're definitely aware of my work. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've had people in hypnosis telling me, um, like giving me a message from them. Uh, and I've had, I had a, uh, I had somebody in hypnosis and their friend who was very psychic came with them as a support person. And afterwards she said, uh, you know, there were two grays in here. And um, wow. there's all, there are also instances where people were directed to come and see me by them. And I, I don't remember exactly how they received the message. Um, but people do receive messages. And um, so, you know, they're definitely aware of what I do. And I feel, especially now, that they want people to be awakened. Yes. They want people to know what's happened to them. Absolutely. Um, yes. So that's why I've never feared them knowing <laughs> what I do. And plus I told them, I said, you know, I'm not going to stop my work. So don't even try it. So, you know, go ahead and keep going. <laughs> you want to hear something funny? Um, my contacts led me to Preston, my oh. ETs. Yeah. They told me I was having a hard time figuring out who to go to. And my contacts said, look, I know somebody, write his name down because I was on board. And I had to find a piece of paper and a pencil that I don't usually have with me, but I somehow managed to find one and wrote his name down and I emailed him. I found him, I, I Googled him first, found his email, and then I emailed him. So, and it oh, just began the long journey. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I suspect that all researchers are known by the ETs. And I've had some experiences yes. myself. I think kind of like you, Yvonne, it's not really our path to talk about ourselves, but to help others. Right. So maybe that's why it's kind of... <laughs> So exactly. yeah, I, I, mean, I just suspect that, but yeah, I've come to believe that they know about all, everything that's going on with them and with us for that matter. Yes. So yes, definitely. When you, when you first started doing this, were, were you a believer? I mean, did you always feel like people are being taken on board? I mean, cause it's I mean, this, I, is, I, I've always been open, open-minded because of my parents. You know, my, like I said, my mom was in the paranormal. My dad really wasn't, but he was uh, supportive of, of her. And we would sit around and talk about ghosts and saw, you know, like uh, spirits. And they were, um, my parents, I remember I was in, it must have been um, junior high. And we were sitting around the dinner table and they're the ones that told me about the 1952 flyover our U.S. Capitol. Mm, of, right. Wow. Yeah. And I was born in 1952, and so my, my sisters went and said, "Oh, they brought you over. That's what that's what happened." <laughs> but yeah, yeah, they're the ones that we and we talked about it, and and um, also I came home from school one day, and my mom had the the magazine look magazine and she said look Eva, look there's these people this couple that said they were taken aboard a spaceship you know and that was betty and barney hill so she um she really i mean my parents really uh, brought the subject to me but even you know during that during junior high and high school i wasn't really into this i didn't read any of any books or anything mm -hmm. it wasn't until I became an adult, like I was saying, in my in probably my thirties, you know, that I I awakened to all of this, and when I and then it was the first time I was exposed to it, it was when I saw Bud Hawkins, and um, that's when I I thought, 
you know, I, I didn't know, I didn't know the details about how people were taken. And, um, I, I became very intrigued just from that, his one lecture. Wow. That's um, amazing. That opened the door then literally for you. It did. I mean, it wow. really did. Um, and I was meant to, you know, to go there with my mother to the whole life expo. That's when we used to have whole life expos all over the country. And so, um, and she's the one that really wanted to go see him, you know, and mm -hmm. it was, yeah, it was really, in this picture, we were in San Marino, Italy, uh, doing a conference back in the in mid nineties. Wow. Nice memories. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I, I, I feel the same way you do. I'm mean, never in a million years thought that this would be something I was doing, but of course here we are. So yeah. you know, when you started getting involved in this, I mean, that must've been quite a shock. What, 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 what were your first cases like? I mean, do you remember what? Oh um, yeah. I mean, I remember my very first, I, I'll never forget. Like, I guess your first love, you don't never forget it. But, um, I remember he, he was a engineer and um, he had had experiences since childhood. And um, that's when I, I was first seeing clients in my home office. And when he first came to the door, I was so nervous. I said, oh my God, what am I doing? You know, <laughs> first, yeah. first client from graduating from college, you know, hypnotherapy college. And um, it, it turned out to be a very interesting session and a lot of information came through and that's you know i think all you need is one good session to you know give you a shot in the arm and say okay this you know this is real this is working but i will you know i'll never forget um that first client oh my gosh and um and then when as i was seeing people the first time because people do relive their experiences through uh, regression and it takes you know a, a skilled and trained hypnotherapist to remove the fear and remove the pain for them to get through it so they could report what's happening well the first time first few times people were screaming and jumping off the couch and or trying to jump off the couch and because they wanted to they were like bolting they wanted to bolt out like they were leaving the you know the UFO and that's that was startling. That was very startling. But you know, with with the experience as I kept doing this, you know, I it's up to me to take control over that. And I just let them know I'm going to touch your shoulders, listen to my voice, and it brings them back. So now, you know, I'm I'm prepared for anything. Nothing shocks me anymore. So yeah. I find it interesting that you help them. You help remove the the fear and the physical movements of them, you know, the shock factor. Uh, I am, um, I've, since I've come out with everything, um, I've been looking at different uh, people who are regressed and stuff like that. And I've come to realize that not all uh, hypnotherapists are created equal. And when Preston told me about you, I was, I was really impressed because you're very responsible. You're not trying to lead them into something. You're letting them, tell you something and uh, fear is the number one reason it's it's really hard for people over fear i see that on board and uh, it's amazing for you i'm happy to hear you say that i really am thank you oh That's thank awesome. you yeah it's like i said it just took uh a lot of ex experience going through it with them you know yeah um and now um now i don't worry i, I know i know what i'm doing uh, this past weekend, I taught my third abduction therapist workshop where uh, for years, when I would lecture at these conferences, I have therapists come up to me and say, how do I do what you do? You know, I, I like to work with some abductees. And that was, you know, that was a long time ago. And I'm thinking, oh, how can I do this? First, I thought about writing a manual, but I said, oh, that'll take too long. And so um, I did my first uh, workshop in, uh, it was right after COVID, right after we got out of the quarantine. And I did, and so I did my third one this past weekend because 
I mean, my goal is to be able to have trained abduction therapists in every one of our 50 states because we need it. And, you know, the amount of people that are coming to me and they're not all in Southern California, they're from everywhere. So I would love to, you know, have my list and say, okay, I, you know, I have a person in your state and so forth. So um, they're, you know, I think they were able to get a lot out of the class. And I mean, I don't, I'm not teaching hypnosis. I'm not teaching from square one. I'm teach. I'm taking them from, they're already using hypnosis in their practice. And I'm taking them from that onward to include these cases because, wow. you know, hypnotherapy college, you don't learn how to work with abduction cases. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I learned actually by sitting in on Bud's cases, on Bud's regressions. And, you know, I, I was very, very fortunate to be able to work with him and watch him because uh, he didn't do it for a long time. He had another uh, couple of psychologists doing the hypnosis for his clients. And then he started doing them. Um, but when he used to travel out to Los Angeles for he would do a show or whatever he was doing, sometimes he would stay with with me and my family, my husband and my kids. And I would drive them to the locations. And so I had the opportunity to be able to sit in on those sessions. And I'll tell you, I learn by, you know, by watching, I learn by doing. And so, you know, looking at a manual doesn't really help me. I, I need to see the action. And so I figure, okay, I learned that way. And this is how I'm going to teach these therapists. So during the two days of my training, I, um, there was, we, we had uh, volunteers from my zero support group and I did mm -hmm. three live regressions on Saturday and three live regressions on Sunday. And these were real regressions. I said, we'd never know what's going to happen. You know, when you regress somebody, maybe nothing will come out. Um, you know, I, wa I wanted them to be prepared for any scenario. So, um, and I feel like, you know, I was able to get a lot out of observing Bud. So that, that's how I started teaching it. All right. Well, here I have a question because I am currently kind of debating this guy who says, you know, hypnosis is not a reliable tool. I'm like, well, hold on a second. I know it works. There has yeah. been studies that have been shown it to be very effective used in the right hands. But a lot of people have misconceptions right. about hypnosis. Oh, yeah. I'm wondering yeah. if you could describe a little bit what it's like and how you, you know that this is a valid tool. Well, you know, they still can't use it in a court of law, you know, um, maybe someday. Like they can't use the um, lie detector um, results in a court of law. Right. But with, um, with my clients, how I judge how they're doing and and if they're healing um now i've seen in my 32 years of oh my gosh so much healing that that is what's kept me in there like when you told me preston oh i heard a lot from your clients and you've helped them tremendously when i get feedback like that that's when i know i'm on the right track here um my you know, job oh, go ahead dolly um, you know, it's accepted by the American Medical Association. I'm a registered nurse. I'm retired. And okay. um, one of the things that uh, we learn is that it is a medical tool. Uh, you can use right. it just to help people stop pain, especially during yeah. childbirth. Yeah. You, can, uh, you can use it uh, for uh, people who have been in a horrific accident or been attacked. Okay. And it helps them yeah. relax and calm down. It's all their relaxation medically is used in hypnotherapy. They have absolute precise, you know, um, scientific methods that they use. And I know that most hypnotherapists, when they you do learn this, you do learn that this is an accepted medical practice and that they do have guidelines, okay? And uh, this is where I was kind of hoping that most hypnotherapists would learn that, you know, what those guidelines are. And then, and then you all be accepted because of what you're doing and go by your guidelines as well, because you guys are the experts. 
you've been in the field with it. You've been doing it for years and years and years. This is how it got accepted medically in the first place because people were hypnotizing way back when, before it was accepted in. And I was kind of hoping, you know, someday they'd listen to you and say, yeah, oh, this is good, you know? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. I might, I've worked with people, you know, relieving pain and, and I've worked with people who've been sexually um, abused and attacked and things like, I mean, it's, you know, PTSD is PTSD, you know, whether you're in a car accident or whether you're abducted by aliens. I mean, the symptoms are the same. So when I have seen my clients and, you know, they first come in and they're, they can't even get through telling their story without crying and, and they're still very traumatized and it affects their whole life. I mean, it, it affects their work because they can't concentrate and we all have to live. I mean, you know, these abduction experiences aren't going to go away. Um, and they're, you know, they're lifelong and, and they affect their children. So when I've seen them change over a period of time, they're able to sleep again. They're able to, you know, live a life. Um, that's when I know, okay, I, I'm doing something positive, you know, I'm doing something right. Um, so, and, and my, my, my first goal is to be their therapist, is to bring up the hidden memories, if, if there are hidden memories there, and bring them up to what they can deal with them, you know, to a conscious level. And I tell them in hypnosis and afterwards during the um, debriefing, I tell them, you know, this happened to you, but you came out of it and you're safe and you're loved and you know you're living a, a good life and that's what's helped them um and the private sessions uh with all the positive suggestions uh, um you know letting go of the pain letting go of the fear and then getting together with like-minded people that's part of the um the therapy is right. to come to the, whether it's on a Zoom meeting or whether it's an in-person meeting, to meet other people and they realize, because they feel alone because they've exactly. never been able to talk to anybody. Yes. So they feel alone. What's wrong with me? But then yeah. they're listening to other people from all walks of life. And I'll tell you that that is really part of the healing process. So um, I continue, you know, doing the zero meetings because I know how valuable they are to people. And I look so forward to them as well. You know, it's, they become family to each other. Yeah. So, well, it's a, it's a good thing. I, I think of it as a really good thing because as you awaken to the truth of the reality that we're all living in right now, okay, it's good to have that connection with each other. Um, it also helps you to uh, awaken further. You know, there's a lot to learn. Once you realize it's real, there's a lot to learn after that. And grouping up and staying exactly. together and, you know, working together through it is an awesome way to go. And I yeah. think you guys are at the ground floor of that, honestly. You know, um, you can't have the government. The government would never think to do this with anybody, you know. So you all are breaking it for everyone. It's good. Well, it's I just good. want to back up a little bit and just re underline mm -hmm. that hypnosis does work. Yes. Yeah. I know this for a couple of reasons, because people who have conscious recall, their recall matches exactly what people are recalling under hypnosis it's there they parallel each other mm -hmm. and mythbusters i don't know if you remember that show yes yeah. they did I, I, I watch it all the time but i, I kind of watch it a couple times yeah, yeah i watched a couple of times but i happened to catch an episode where they decided to tackle regressive hypnosis oh i didn't see that yeah oh you should ivana i was so gratified because they staged an incident where they had an intruder come in and create a ruckus Okay. And then they told the whole staff, this was a setup. We want you all to write down everything you recall about this person who came in, what he was wearing, hair, eye color, everything. And they did. They said, okay, now we're going to put you under regressive hypnosis and see if we can get any more details. And boy, did they. And it was accurate. So this was a live demonstration of how well it really works. How did they do? Uh, how many people did they have? I mean, they didn't regress them all in the same room, did they? No, okay. no. They, they had, I think they did it with three of their staff members, the three people okay. they usually work with. But it was like, wow, this is cool. That's fantastic. 
so but I'm still thinking that there's a lot of people out there who don't even know what hypnosis is. So they if you could let them know what is hypnosis. Well, you know, it's an accepted practice among the police. It's an accepted yeah. practice. Yes, absolutely. The fastest way you can get details on a, a suspect is to regress the per, the victim and they come out, they get the people drawing the picture, everything. It is the most accurate way to get information. And they've been doing this for 50 years. This and is they've written thing. down um they've written down license plates numbers. Yes. Exactly. You know, getaway yes. car. And so yeah. oh my Which god. Still a kidnapping. That's how they got the license plate for that. Yeah. The, so you know, people who come to me, oh, I would say 90% of the people who come to me have never been hypnotized before. Never thought about it. Someone said, oh, yeah, I was at a party and they did, you know, stage hypnosis. But of course, that's totally different. Um, but I always I tell them before we even start, I like to dispel the myths about hypnosis. I tell them you're not unconscious. You're not blacked out. I tell them like, like I'm talking to your conscious mind right now which makes up about 20% of the total mind power. Now we're going to go deep into the subconscious, the stronger part of the mind, which makes up 80% of the mind power. And that's why hypnosis, hypnotherapy works so rapidly because we're dealing with a stronger part of the mind. And with hypnosis, I tell them I'm going to set aside the conscious mind. We're going to set aside the, part of the mind in between the conscious and subconscious, which is the critical area of mind. That's the one that goes, oh, I don't believe this. And they, you know, they edit and they question and <laughs> say, we don't want that. We're going to set it aside. And I just tell them whatever comes forward, just verbalize it. I always tell them verbalize, verbalize and not to be quiet and hold back. Right. And I tell people, look, we're going into the unknown. Don't worry about it sounding like, oh, I can't tell her this because she's going to think I'm crazy. Yeah. I said, it may sound crazy to you, but I probably heard it a hundred times. So yeah. I just said, I always tell them just to verbalize it. Let's bring it forward. And we talk about it later. And so um, they, oh, I had one today, very first client and never had been hypnotized. He was great in verbalizing everything even if he wasn't sure I, you know i remind them don't add it you know don't question yourself um and you know we talk about it later and i so i give them a little bit of confirmation not leading them but you know i will tell them something like um oh what, what's an example uh you know if they if they saw a a particular something in the room you know like those What's really interesting is those, you know, you've heard the round room and then they have the benches that are just come out of the of the wall and everybody kind of sits there like a waiting room. Right. I hear that so much. And so what, if I hear that from a client, I, I could tell them, give them a little bit of confirmation. You know, when you told me about, you know, you're sitting on this bench and I've heard this many, many times. And when you give them the little confirmation, it makes them feel like, you know, oh, I'm not making this up. I'm not crazy. You know, that sort right. of thing. Um, I just feel like that's really valuable to give that to them before they leave my office. Yeah. So it's uh, it's it's very safe, as you know, Dolly. It's very yeah. safe to tell them I don't use drugs or mind control. Um, and I tell them when you're in hypnosis, if something gets very frightening to you, and of course, I always try different techniques and suggestions, but although if, if they're still frightened, I, I ask them, do you want to go on or do you want to stop? Right. Cause they have right. that choice. Absolutely. And, their autonomy um, is tough. Yeah. A lot of them, many of them will say, no, I want to go on, even though they're scared because they've waited so long and right. others have said, no, I, uh, you know, I need to come out. Like they've had enough to digest and everybody's different. I don't know. You know how anybody's going to react. Uh, right. so, There's you know, no, you know, no, yeah. Every every human being thinks differently. And when I was in uh, school, we learned that. Um, okay, I minored in psychology. So from the psychology standpoint, you're giving it exactly. Okay, from the science of the brain 
part of it. We know that you have short-term memory and long-term memory. And in your hippocampus, it's making decisions about where to take the short-term memory and file it away in long-term memory. And that's where you uh, are met with two things. One is you have preconceived, pre-learned things. Your reality in your mind is set in your hippocampus. It's sort of like a guide for filing everything down. So when you see something, it's in your short-term memory. If you're given a week to two weeks, it's already been thought through and it's gone into your long-term memory at that point. And by hypnotizing somebody, by bringing them to be completely calm, relaxed, and lucid, absolutely lucid. And that's what you're looking for. You're looking for the brain to shut everything else down and to become absolutely lucid in their own memory. And it's not, you're not, you have no control of it. They do. They have exactly. absolute control over their own mind exactly. and their own minds. And it's important to, you know, be able to hear that from somebody. You and know? We, yeah. And when you explain that, and I'm glad you're explaining that here for the show, that, you know, there'll be, uh, so people can understand that this is a, a a wonderful tool, you know, to bring up hidden memories and relieve the PTSD. And it's very safe, you know, in, if you're in the hands of somebody well-trained, it's, you know, it's very safe. Yes, absolutely. I agree. So so how common do you think the UFO experience is? Because the Roper poll, which I'm sure you're aware of in 1991, um, one in 50 people show the markers of being a contactee. So do you think it's that common? Oh, I, I certainly do. Absolutely. Um, if the general public knew how common this was, like, <laughs> I think they'd be a little, you know, freaked out about it because, um, and it's, I tell people, look, it's so common. You can look down your street, you know, you may have a hundred houses all the way down your block and, uh, you know, 50, um, out of that um, is going to be, they're going to be affected, you know, um, or no, am I saying that wrong? We say uh, two, what was that statistic again? One, I think it's one in 50. One in 50. So yeah. there'll be two people, I'm sorry, two people out of those, or two families out of those hundred houses. And that's how I explained it before I was, you know. The 20%, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That they're going to be affected um, and have this experience because it is that common. Uh, and when you look, you know, think about it that way. I said, look at in your office, if there's 100 people, there's going to be two people out of that 100 people that are being affected. I said, you know, if you start a conversation, I, when I was writing or when I published Coronado, I went went to the bank to open up a, a, a account, bank account for it. <laughs> Thanks, Preston. I was talking to my, um, it was my banker. You know, he took me in his office. Go, okay, what kind of account do you want? And I told him in my book and, oh, what's it about? So I tell him and he goes, he leans over and he goes, I've never told anybody this. He said he was lived in a high rise uh, apartment and his, his wife, wife and little son infant son were asleep and at midnight he got up and he felt like he wanted to go out to the balcony i thought oh my god you know how many people have said that they just feel like to go outside and he said as he was standing there lighting a cigarette um he saw these lights coming towards him and he thought it was a plane he goes oh my god it's you know it's really low it's gonna hit our building and he said it just it just kind of came towards him and he realized, you know, can't be a plane. And then he doesn't remember anything after that. Um, and he said, he want to tell anybody because I, you know, they think I'm crazy. I mean, we, and we didn't do any. He didn't pursue. I gave him my card and he, he didn't pursue having, um, I don't think he wanted to know, having um, regression. Because it was, I was a red flag to me because so many people tell me, oh, at midnight, I, I was going to get in my car and drive to the, desert you know, or go outside and then they see this craft so when you bring it up you know on an everyday basis when you're doing your errands you'd be surprised how many people will tell you something so it's very oh, yeah. good every yeah it's 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 not surprising no um, 
I, I have a question for you. You have consensus now of, of, of what you've learned. Okay. You have an idea of waiting, weighing, um, an idea in your mind has got to be springing around in there somewhere about how you feel about what's actually going on with ETs. What do you think their main drive is toward us? Do you have an idea? What I have felt for a while is um, because of the amount of cases I've worked with and because everybody that's had this experience has been shown these hybrid babies, men mm -hmm. and women. And I felt and I feel that the hybridization program is very central to what they're doing. Now, at this point, I don't know um, why they're creating these hybrids. I mean, I know my colleague David Jacobs thinks that they're planning on taking us over um, in his book, I think, um, one of his books, Threat, The Threat, I think it was. Yeah. But I never felt that way. Um, I think they do need us. And now with these, you know, I've been, like I said, doing these over three decades, I, these babies and children grow and people have felt that they have met people or hybrids here on earth. Uh, and um, by the last 10 years, I think, People have been telling me that, and I think I came across one in, in the Roswell conference one year, little boy, around 10 years, 10 or 12 years, years old. I mean, he was, he was very different. Um, and the way he asked questions, you know, I showed triangular shaped marks on bodies and he asked a question, not like a 12 year old boy. He, had, he asked a question like a scientist. It's like, and Ron Regeer, and the other speaker was lecturing upstairs and he came down and afterwards he goes, did you have a little boy in your lecture? I said, yes. And this lady tried to, you know, she followed him out, tried to take a picture of him and he was by himself. So, you know, I don't think we recognize them if we're just walking by them, but people have said it's when you stop and talk to them, you know, engage with them. There's something very different about them. So I, was I feel ask that, if you've ever had one regressed that was a hybrid. I uh, I wouldn't know. I don't think so. No. I don't think so. Okay. Well, we need to. You know, I wouldn't be able to present someone as a hybrid unless I unless I had something, you know, to show. Also, the scientific community. Okay, we we did we've done a blood panel. And, and we don't know what this is. You know, we've never seen this before. I mean, people do claim that they feel like they're hybrids, and they may be, um, but I, I wouldn't be able to present them uh, unless I had some kind of scientific backing right now because, you know, we get, oh, my gosh, you know, the especially the abduction field, I mean, Think about what we're talking about, you know, beings coming in your room and taking you out of your car. And uh, so we get, uh, you know, what, what did Bud call it? We are the whipping boy of, you know, <clears throat> society and the scientific community because we can't prove it. We right. can't prove it. Um, I'm glad you said it. Absolutely. <laughs> Honestly, because you would not have a, a regressed hybrid. Hybrids are already aware they would never give that information to you that way. So, yeah. so yeah. So, um, I mean, I would love to. I mean, I have no doubt that there's hybrids walking around. I really don't. And, um, but we need to have because now UFOs are really in the conversation now. I mean, with the congressional hearing, with those Navy pilots coming forward, uh, that congressional hearing, I cleared my calendar that day so I could watch the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 okay. I, I came away with it from it feeling very positive because of the three witnesses, sworn in witnesses. And if they lied, you know, that's perjury. And so I feel like, oh my God, you know, they have a lot to lose for getting up there. And the questions were uh, that were posed to them were very, very good questions. Like, 
people they wanted to know actually what happened. So we're supposed to have another hearing pretty soon, which um, I, I'm not sure when. I don't know if you guys have the the date on that, but I'm going to watch it again. But I have felt very positive about. I feel like we're moving. I mean, slowly, but I feel like we're moving forward um, with more people, like whistleblowers, coming out and saying, "Yeah, we have this stuff." and other whistleblowers backing them up. And you know how that works with other cases. Um, one or two come forward and then more whistleblowers come forward and they say, oh, yeah, that happened to me. And and more and more and more, I think we're gonna be uh, experiencing that. I'm, so, I'm waiting for the day where they open the pod bay doors and they show you the craft, it, where they show yeah. you the bodies, where they show you their data. Because I'm thinking they have, I know, they have way more data than they're saying. I think they so. Well, I think so. And thank goodness for people like David Grush coming forward and others um, because it's like they want to know the truth. We all want to know the truth. And, you know, I think we feel, you know, we do deserve the truth. And Absolutely. we want to be vindicated in our lifetime. You know, i I feel like I've been doing this for all these years. I don't feel like I've wasted my time. I don't feel like I've been doing it for nothing. It, I know that, I know that there's, you know, it, the path is going to lead us to where we are going to finally get the truth. Because I think more people are going to come forward. More, I mean, abductions happen to anybody and everybody, and they do not discriminate. Um, it's all uh, walks of life. And so, that so was going to be one of my questions. <laughs> I mean, is there a pattern that you see? Because to me, it's no evenly pattern. divided between men and women. As far as, <laughs> no. I mean, people go, oh, maybe the blood type, maybe the, you know, no. As far as I know right now, no. I, and I tell people, they, you know, however they choose you and your family, it's going to be a lifelong experience. And so, and there's Chosen. There's my third edition of Chosen. <laughs> Um, it's, I'm trying to, you know, to get the right words, but, um, gosh, I see here I am. I'm getting old, you guys. It's okay. Um, it's okay. What, was, what was your question, Preston? It was like, oh, the pattern, right? Yeah. The pattern. Yeah. Um, Anybody and everybody, socioeconomic background, um, you know, it just, I have people that are uh, famous and not famous and rich and poor and um, I don't amazing. know. It's, it, yeah. And so, but I feel, um, I feel something is coming in my book chosen when I first wrote it. Uh, the second edition has in, I added in the last part of the book about what I called um, the urgency. Because I had been hearing from abductees, experiencers, people that don't know each other, brand new clients coming in my office, one after you, the other saying, you know, I feel like I'm supposed to do something. I think I'm supposed to come here so I can find out what happened to me. So I'm supposed to do something with it. Others had told me, many have said, I don't, I'm not happy with my career anymore. I make a lot of money, but it's not important to me anymore. I need, I was supposed to do something else. Well, so many people are, um, have told me this, that I had to put it in my book. And That's then the last couple of years, people have said, it's ratcheting up, ratcheting up. It's getting, you know, it, it's coming uh if something's coming very, very fast. And then with everything that was happening with, um, you know, the Navy pilots coming forward with that Tic Tac video and um, and then with the congressional hearing, that I really feel that we're close to something. Um, Do you I, have you any know, of your experiencers tell you they have a message from ET? Does that, do you run across that? Oh, all the time. I mean, the best, there, the message... Is there like um, a main theme among them? Let me, um, words? I'm, let me, te I'm sorry, let me text my sister because she has to go out and 
she can come and get them. <laughs> She's right next <laughs> to me. No worries. Yeah. <laughs> Life, everybody. <laughs> hey, yep. the good news is we can do this. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sweet. Okay. So, um, I just want to answer Chris Phoenix's question real here because it's a quick one. He's asking, "What does CHT stand for?" That's clinical hypnotherapist, right? Yeah, so, or, or yeah, or certified certified hypnotherapist. Oh, yes. Right. Thank you for the question. Um, okay. Um. Okay, so we were talking about yes, oh, oh the messages. Really? Okay. Um, for years, of course, the messages have been that we are not taking care of our planet. We uh, we need to love each other more. We can change the course of things, and it sounds so. And I would say it in my. Um, in my lectures, it sounds so simplistic, but love each other more and we can change the course of things. We don't have to go in the direction of, uh, you know, apocalypse because many experiencers have dreams up until present day about apocalyptic events, um, flooding, Heard that. Flooding, yep. fires, um, in fact, I, I I had it so much in my practice that over the years, uh, one of my serial members, Steve Neal, he's in the film industry. He is an artist, and he drew these pictures for me: tsunamis, you know, bombs exploding. And I still show them because that's what people are getting. Um, and now I'm I'm become very unnerved. I had a, a meeting, serial meeting yesterday on Zoom what what is happening around the world we've got flooding everywhere canada was on fire the huge uh earthquakes that we've been having lately um well, there's a reason for it it's not global warming at all <laughs> okay exactly and i'm looking at this going oh my god and that's what experiences have been seen or give are the messages you know coming to them um and there's you know there's been but mainly, I mean, mainly the uh, the theme has been all these years is that we need to be aware of what we're doing to our planet. Also, we need to get rid of our weapons, um, you know, nuclear weapons. Look what happened in the 60s when they flew over the military installations and turned them off, and then they turned yeah. them back on. I mean, if that wasn't a huge message, you know, um, the, the ability that they have. Um, so I, I would like to hear what you what you feel or know what these uh, events around the world represent. You know, the re yeah. The uh, reason well, wait, 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 before you do, Dolly, let's just take a right. quick station identification because okay. we go. have to do that. We're one hour in, okay. so I want to remind you all that you are watching the Light Gate. I'm your host, Preston Dennett. My lovely host is Dolly Safran. Our guest tonight is Yvonne Smith, CHT, certified hypnotherapist, author of Chosen and Coronado. She's a speaker and a presenter, and the links are in the description. We are streaming live on United Public Radio Network, 107.7 FM from New Orleans. Also, the UFO Paranormal Radio Network, 105. Point three. We're also on YouTube, Roku, and Facebook. So yeah, um, our audience is growing fast. So thank you all again for joining us. And I do have your questions lined up to ask Yvonne. We're getting close. But all right, Dolly, take it away. <laughs> yeah, I'm interested. <laughs> um, I am a, uh, well, when Preston sent the book to you, that's why we did it because we i feel like full disclosure to everybody who comes on this show about my side of it and uh basically you're looking and hearing from an actual hybrid i am a hybrid i am uh here to bring uh information and uh the truth and from et and i love it that you've picked up on a lot of the uh information already it, that is Love is the most important thing we can do for one another. We need to love one another. We need to stop all the 
you just need to stop. <laughs> no yeah. more division, none of that. Um, also, we need to stop how we're polluting our planet because it pollutes us. It's damaging us. And the acts of war, aggression, tyranny, all of that terror are breaking up our abilities that we are born with, innate abilities to be psychic and to actually communicate with the universe itself and ET in particular. Uh, we are going through a period of time now uh, and I'm answering you now exactly what's happening. We're, we have in our solar system, you know, we're in a big galactic, you know, we're in a galaxy. And in this galaxy, there are several of them, but every 12,000 years, our solar system goes through one. It's an electromagnetic current sheet. It changes our sun's polarity, which ignites us all to change our polarity, all the planets. And so, as you know, our poles are excursioning right now. They're changing. They're no longer where they were, and they're going to flip. They're going through the process of it. Our magnetosphere is taking huge hits from it. We're 40% down, which means all the galactic radiation from space has a 40% higher chance of hitting the Earth. We know for the last 100 years, there's an increase in cancer, mental problems, autoimmune disorders, name it. Let's just go down the list. Yeah. ETs have been in contact heavily with us in the last 60 to 80 years. Uh, to help hold our DNA up. Because the one thing we do know for a fact is that our DNA deras is under gamma radiation. They've proven it, NASA's proven it, science has proven it. Um, we had two astronauts, identical twins, one went up, one stayed down. When he came back, his DNA no longer matched his brother. This sent alarm bells through everybody. Space is not safe. And it's even less safe for us right now. They have been holding us up. They've been bringing us through this as best they can without interfering in our lives because we are autonomous beings. They are autonomous as well. They are our progenitors. We are related to them, absolutely related. That's why we can breed back and forth with one another. It's not a breeding program. It's to hold up our DNA and to prepare us for moving off of here. We need to get out and we're running out of time. The governments on this planet have not been very forthcoming to the world. They have not told them that they've known about this for a long time. They have not uh, wanted to lose the control that they have over everybody. You know, there's an old saying, the master is still here. His whip is no longer painful on your back. It's in your pocketbook. And they get from you what they want that way. They make you work and pay money to them so that they can get what they want. Um, gold is the basis of all money. You know this. Uh, gold and silver and gems and jewels. One percent of them own the planet worldwide and they 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 want to survive it they have underground facilities all over the world you should know this already they have seed depositories they have made moves for the last 50 years to protect themselves from it we have 8.4 billion people or so on this planet right now and not everybody is going to fit down there two percent of the population one percent and uh the rest of us are expendable they understand that we are consciousness. They understand that we lead, lead many lives. They understand that this isn't the only rodeo for us, that we will move on and do other things. And they have no compunction about leaving us of our stay here quickly so that they can survive and live and still be in control of themselves. They think they have a plan to survive it. I find it interesting because, uh, no, <laughs> what's coming is will far surpass anything that they're capable of protecting themselves from. The only uh, safe haven is that we've had the last 80 years to talk about this openly and freely with one another. We've had all this time to work together to prepare ourselves for it and to be ready to go when ET could come back and get us because they are not here now. They left two years ago. They are not here. But the people that are here have back engineered downcraft. They have developed all these new technologies that they took from them and they're using it to control us even harder. And it's an insane asylum now, as far as I'm concerned. And the messages from AT is this, wake up, use your abilities, clean your body up, clean the water you drink up, stop using processed foods, stop eating fluoride, it's messing you up. Listen for us, we will communicate with you. And they are communicating. You said some very key things. You have the feeling sometimes that you just need to go outside. You're hearing them without realizing you're doing it. They're telling you. They've been all over this planet coming to the to the everyday everybody and saying, hi, how you doing? We exist. 
They've done it for children. They've done it for adults. They've done it for groups. They're here. We know it. Our disclosure has already happened. The governments want you to believe it hasn't, and that's not okay. And so I'm here to bring the truth. That's what's going on. We have a planet that is going to heave and hoe. Our, our um, earth is breaking. Our mantle is breaking free. We're now one day short. We're short a 24-hour now. We're just under the 24-hour mark. If you've noticed from your childhood to now that the point where the sun comes up in the east has moved 40 degrees, okay? Over the last 50 years, and I know this personally, uh, they've had to move every uh, readjust every altimeter at every airport globally because it keeps moving because the poles are moving. They're excursioning. The reason ET can't fly here right now is because of that. It's too volatile an environment for them to be in, and they had to go. They will come back when it settles down, but we're facing three upheavals. The first one is a giant CME that will send us globally into the Stone Age. It will down our grids worldwide, 10 miles deep straight into the ground. The second thing that's going to happen is we're going to have a uh, land mass movement that's incredible. And when that happens, we're going to have a water event, like was told in the days of Noah, where water is going to try to cover the earth. And the third thing that's going to happen, and it's already in process, um, our poles have melted. It's not because of global warming. This is their lie. It's because our mantle has heated up because the friction between the mantle and all the magma underneath has heated everything up to the point that it melted the poles. The Beaufort Gyre, I don't know if you know what that is, but it's when all that fresh water melts into the sea. Just above, um, um, you know, in Canada, just between like Canada and uh, where we are at, you know, Newfoundland and all that, in the Atlantic up there is where the gyre begins. That's the first sign that we have now stopped the engine that warms our water and we are going to go into an ice age rapidly into an ice age. And that Beaufort gyre has now ceased. No more heating there. They can say El Nino or La Nina all they want to. It is going to stop. And our winters this year, you're going to see it really beginning, are going to be freezing. And you're going to see the ice start packing back up at the two poles. But it's not the two poles that we know. It's where the poles are going through that it's going to do it. Okay. This is going to make the earth, which wobbles already, flop over. The reason we're 40 degrees out of tilt now is because the water hit from the poles and now it's swung around wildly and we've moved our tilt and our axis. Once that refreezing begins, it's going to drag us over and the mantle's going to move and that's when the water's going to hit us. This is, this, this is very similar to what a lot of the contactees are getting. Con Dolly is, of course, a contactee. I yeah. do want and to get to some of the questions because we got yeah. like. So just real people. quick, um, Dolly, the other, you reminded me that the other messages, um, and there was one case I put in Coronado as a child, and others have been getting this that they're going to have to choose between staying here with the, fa the family members that aren't coming right. and going to where they're supposed to go because they have a job to do. Right. Exactly. And yeah. So that, that's been, yeah, I've had, I've heard that message many, many times. Right. So okay. before we get to the questions, do you want to talk a little bit of it about either of your books, Coronado or um, Chosen? Well, Coronado, it's going into the second edition, but it's still available on Amazon. Yeah. It's about a mass abduct abduction that happened on Coronado Island in San Diego in 1994. We were having a, a uh, UFO conference at the time. It was uh, hosted by the um, Triad Conference, uh, which was funded by Bob Bigelow at the time. And that's where all of us would, would lecture for, uh, John Mack and all of us. We would go across the country. And um, for this conference, I was the MC, And so there were several of my students members that drove down and because they wanted to meet other experiencers from all over that were coming <clears throat> and during the course of that conference there were a dozen people that were abducted and wow. it took <laughs> it took a lot of years to put it together um it, it 
there was so there's so much to this case. I mean, I was still doing regressions as I was writing the book. And Preston, later, I'd like to talk to you more about that because I know you said you were on the island and you had attended that conference. I was there, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so I I uh, regressed all of the people and I have drawings in there. People remember seeing each other on the craft. Um, it was, <laughs> the island was full of Secret Service because President Clinton was coming in. And I was, it was curious to me that they didn't make us move our conference. They didn't make us change the date. They didn't make us change the location, which I found, found out later that that's really strange. They knew we were going to be there. Um, so I, I'm going to go, I'm going into the second edition and adding some more information. So Preston, if you have any information and I'm reaching out to people who were on the island that during that weekend and asking them you know if they remember anything but the craft that came was huge huge i mean they knew they were doing a huge operation um and because there was so many people involved and then my book chosen of course is um i have several cases in there um in both books i include the unedited transcripts I want because I want people to know what exactly a person goes through in regression. So I didn't want to edit them if they're true, they're you know they're real and what everybody went through. There's pictures, uh, there's uh, photographs. I have everybody draw what they remember consciously and what they remember in regression. That's all part of the um, therapy and the healing, and that's now uh, available on Amazon. We're also Ciro, several several members of Ciro, but we're putting together a book about their experiences and what it means to be part of the support group for three decades. Uh, hopefully, we were hoping to get that out winter this winter, but it's it's a huge project, so it's going to be next year. And then we're also working on a Ciro documentary that we've been filming for about a year to show the human side, the sensitive side of what happens in somebody's life when this occurs, when they're having this experience and it's affecting the whole family. So I'm going to be posting these announcements on my website. So I feel now that the more we bring the, this forward, the more we talk about it, the, the, the more people are going to come forward. And then when we have the masses coming forward, what's the government going to do? You know, I mean, they're trying exactly. to still hold on and, you know, hear the congressional hearings. And like you said, Dolly, they have more, more than what they're, they want to tell us. And of course they do. Um, but I think it's going to be the experiencers that are going to drive, you know, the. Um, I 100% agree. And they're not talking yeah. about them really at all. <laughs> they're talking about sightings and crash mm -hmm. travel, but not talking about. Yeah, they're not taking them more. I mean, we're still, we're still working you know we're, we're still going you know uphill battle because because you know it's abductions it's abductions and um i'm waiting for the day that we're going to be at a congressional hearing and talk about okay this is real and present witnesses from all walks of life the day will come um it has to because more people are coming forward they they're tired of living a, a, a secret life is what they say and, and they're you know right. and they want they want the truth now so that's why we're doing all these projects and i'll keep you put you both posted about you know about when it's all going to happen that's awesome cool. well there was one well the whole book chosen is filled with amazing cases and some really unusual experiences <laughs> but one that really struck me profoundly was of course the case of jesse and john long particularly because john long became so interested in building a magnetic motor and actually filed patents He's got yes. a, like a high school education. Yes. And that is amazing to me because they're giving people information. On it's what, and that's what he said. He was implanted as a child. They were both implanted. It happened when they were four or five years old. He was implanted. It was behind the ear. And he still it's still there. We were going to have it removed after I regressed him in the 90s. And he then he called me and he said, 
I can't do that. I don't want to, I don't want to have it removed because he said that was the agreement he had with his tall friend. His tall friend was the uh, praying mantis um, when he was a child. <clears throat> and he said that was the agreement that if he kept it in, he was going to get information. And that's when he started getting, he had I me, mean, he applied for about six patents for, you know, what yeah. he was inventing. Yeah, he was visited by some government people who said, you know what, <laughs> you might have to file this top secret. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. tremendous. Yeah, he was visited because he wanted to know, they wanted to know, because he said he was talking about magnetics in space. And they wanted to know where he got that information. Well, that was his <laughs> information. Yeah. I mean, that just goes to show how serious our governments, despite their denials, are taking this information. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if this didn't exist, and if what they said was real, why would they come and harass people? Right. We have a lot of people who are harassed. Yeah. So. All right. So are you, are you ready to take some questions now? Yes, because I'm choking here. <laughs> the talking. <laughs> All right, I'll give you a, a, a quick chance here and let just show some of the super chats. And I want to thank you guys for donating to the super chats. It really does help to help fund the show, which does cost us some money. This, we're not doing this, of course, for money. It's to help right. others. This is a hugely right. important subject. And as Yvonne knows, there's not a whole lot of money <laughs> to be made in the UFO no. field. <laughs> I tell people, I tell my audiences, if you want to make money, if that's your goal, don't go into the UFO field. That's right. <laughs> they all laugh. Yeah. But it's true. All right. So here is a question from Tools, which needs to be addressed because there are people who feel like this. If ETs love us, why are we so often treated like cattle? You know, they um, they abduct people. They they take them out of their natural environment, take them up to the ship, do what they need to do. I just feel that they have, they have an agenda. And just as Dolly was saying, you know, they need, they need, and I, and I said it too, they need uh, us, our DNA for their program. I don't feel that they're evil in any way. Everybody goes, Oh, are they good? Are they bad? You know, that's the human, always the human question. I, I've never felt they were evil, but, they do have their job to do and um, they're carrying it out. They, the ones that do this work, uh, the small gray ones that take people and the ones that are, are performing the um, examinations and so forth, you know, they, they don't, I don't, I don't feel that they're, they're aware of the kind of fear we humans feel. Oh, they're and, aware. They're very aware. Absolutely aware. The, the little ETs the are AI. They're um, biological AI, and they are very, very aware. Um, what they can't do is emote back to the people. There are others on right. board the craft that do understand and work with them. I am one of them, actually, on board. And I talk to people all the time. They're on board. I help people, people calm. I tell them whatever they want to know. I walk them through the process, walk them around the ship. We let them experience this in a positive way, not a negative way. And not everybody remembers it though, because as you know, people are walking on board with preconceived ideas. And if you think something's going to be horrible, it will be, you'll, you've already put it in that light. Sure. Really hard. Now those that we see over and over and over again, we're working with them constantly. And over time they, they go, Oh yeah. Okay. I'm good. You know, let's go. You yeah. Know? I found that too. And I found it interesting that you that you help calm people down because I have found that many, many of my cases, the ones that came in very traumatized, I call it the graduation period because they're taken and they're they're told to calm the people and escort them from one part of the ship to another. Right. It's in my Coronado book. Yeah. Um, and I'm just amazed. So I just I say, oh, you graduated. You know, um, so yeah, it's interesting. All right. Well, here is another question, which is quite interesting. I was wondering about this myself. This comes from Neural Channels, and he asks, can everyone be hypnotized? And if not, what are the variables 
that one cannot be hypnotized. What I learned in college, all my training, that everybody can be hypnotized. And I've had the, the toughest, <laughs> the toughest clients. Um, you have to come in and actually want to be hypnotized and just let go of um, the control you think that you need to have and, and that you're not that you're going to lose control. But it, I just tell people, just come in and let me do my job. And so I, I, we're going to do the relaxation, which is, I said, the nice part of it. But I feel it's a myth that uh, – there's certain people that cannot be hypnotized. It's just they've made up their minds that they're not going to be hypnotized. So um, when people come actually come in my office and they fill out all the paperwork, and even though they are, and I, you know, I've worked with people who own corporations and they're always used to being in control and they just let themselves go and they go back to being a 10 year old child and they have the experience. So if you do want to be regressed, um, as we talked about it in, in the show, it's very safe when you are with a therapist who is well trained, and you just have to come in with um, a very positive attitude, and and just saying that you want this information, you want to know what happened to you during these experiences, and just kind of let yourself go and and let me or whoever you're working with be your facilitator that's all it is we're not controlling your actions or mind but um i still feel and very strongly that everybody and anybody can be hypnotized well how, how long does it take to put someone under trance and does one session suffice no <laughs> no <laughs> um, no uh that's the thing that's a real complicated you know work it's very tedious everybody we all have to have patience because everybody's different to do the um induction takes about 20 25 minutes <clears throat> and then we go back you know and we go back in time to wherever they want to go and explore but sometimes it depends on the person like we said everybody's different sometimes the first session we get lots of information many times like i just had this week this past weekend blocks we get into blocks we can't go past a certain a certain point uh, they could put a block in or it's the subconscious at the same time protecting you i had a gentleman uh, and this has been many people too to say they they have a bright light right in front of their face so they can't get past it yeah so i'm glad you said that it's always been uh, my people ask me all the time you know et is giving me blocks and i'm like no that's not how it works you're doing it. It's you. You, it's, you, you, you. And, and yeah, um, I mean, because they're, right. you know, it's it's the unknown, and they don't know exactly. if they want to go forward. So right. that's why, you know, it takes well over just one session. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I wish yeah. it didn't. It would make my work easier. But I've been working mm -hmm. with clients since I've been doing this because, yeah, a lifelong experience. After a while, say they come to me for like six to ten sessions, they will they will finally, you know, you're putting together a big puzzle for them, putting all the pieces for them, and they finally kind of get a picture, and then they, they kind of take a break and they they want to digest everything and write about it and you know do their drawings. And then they'll come back in a few months because there's still more. There's still more to to explore. And the more they explore and the more knowledge they have, the fear dissipates, you know, with all the therapy, with all the, you know, um, like I said, the being together with like-minded people, the fear dissipates. And then that's when they're able to receive messages and they've been receiving messages. Some are given the tour of the ship. Some are, exactly. you know, I mean, no, this is what I've said many times. Yeah. You need to get past the fear to get to some of the gooders, you know, yeah. the gooder, to get the better stuff. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's just, um, and I never, everybody goes, how many sessions will it take? I have no idea. I go, you know, I, I mean, I'm right. at least six, you know, at least, but it's hard to tell because I, I said everybody is so different. Um, and sometimes the floodgates open. Uh, but the first session was always the most difficult because 
most people have never been hypnotized. We're going into the unknown. We've never worked together. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, I, I give people credit for coming in and doing this, though. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my, my, my memory went into, I made myself hypnotize myself. I have an eidetic memory, so I knew they were there. Okay. And I have, but I have missing, had some missing time still. And I was trying to get it to all come back to me. And once I got proof to myself that this was real, I wasn't Lulu. That's yeah. when I, I, I went over the top and I just sunk to the floor in our bathroom, turned the lights out, put my hands down, totally relaxed and let my identic memory take over. And I just let myself, I gave myself permission to remember. Okay, yeah. because yeah. I have not had that personal permission to do it before that. My mom was working real hard to keep me gone from it. And once oh, I gave yeah. myself permission, oh, my God, it opened up on me. And it was a, it was tremendous. It took days to finally, like, integrate myself back into my yeah. own memories. And uh, it was painful, too. I had a nosebleed from it and everything. I mean, it was oh, incredible. Oh, God. Yeah, um, I can imagine. I had migraines, the whole thing. Yeah, family now, plays a big role in all of this. Yes. Now we encourage parents to yeah. support them, their right. children, especially. Yeah. This starts at a very young age. And how many times yeah. have you heard kids tell their parents and they're not believed? Oh, God. Yeah. 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 Or, yeah. Your parent, or your parent doesn't want to believe. That, that's, <laughs> yeah. well, that's a really it's good very problem. frightening. Yeah. I mean, I tell yeah. parents that don't ever tell the children that is, oh, if it's a dream, it's not going to happen again because it will happen again. Right. And they're not going to trust what you say. That's right. And, and I, I feel that as a parent and a therapist, I could tell other parents what I've been through because my five-year-old son came in and told me, you know, there's a tall spider in my room. He would sleep on the floor next to me every single night. He'd come in in the middle of the night because he didn't want to sleep in his room. So, you know, of course, I was... I was like, I can't believe this is happening to my child. But then it made sense because I was getting into the field. But of course, my husband at the time blamed me because he said, it's your oh, work. You, know. Put it in. you know, and so and of course, he's a wow. father. And I, I when I work with with couples and the dads are especially bothered with it because they feel like they have to protect their families and why, you know, how can they protect their families when they don't know when it's, when this is happening, they can't do anything about it. So um, he, you know, he rightly so, I mean, I, I can understand, um, you know, his stance on it, but I told him it had nothing to do with my work. I mean, you know, he was chosen for whatever reason we were chosen. Um, but yeah, it's really, it's really difficult for parents when they start hearing their children saying really strange things. But that's when I get the parents in when they tell me, you know, this has been happening to me all my life. And now I've got to find out what happened to me so I can help my children. That's when they yeah. finally say they can't put it on the back burner anymore. They've got to, they've got to do something about this. So, right. you know, it's, it's I think very that's what bothers a lot of people mo most is the loss of control and, yeah, you know, reality is, is, is it affects your children. All over the place. Yeah, my mom just wanted to live a normal life in her mind. Sure. And, yeah. and, and we already had this issue going on from my birth, literally. My dad also, my dad is a contactee, and he wow. was keeping it secret from me most of my life until I woke up and went, oh, my God. And uh, my mom finally backed down, and she just... She just she wouldn't talk about it, even though we were talking about it. She'd leave the room and go away. And oh, okay. she just could not handle it at all. My dad hated it. <laughs> not To the day he died, he would not read anything I wrote about UFOs. Wouldn't touch it. What about your mom, Preston? She passed before I could ever talk about it. I oh, really, really God. wonder. Because it is in yeah. my family, for sure. I mean, she helped wake him up, though, after death. She came to <laughs> Yeah, she did. She did. Literally yeah. showed it. <laughs> All right. Well, we got more questions. Or, or unless you have more. Okay. Because no question is off limit. So a few of these are a bit non sequiturs. And this is one of them. And he's asking me, John P. Adventures, Preston, please comment on the Mexico Nazca three foot reptilians. And, uh, and I'm sure, Yvonne, you might have an opinion on this. I'm going to wait 
until I get more information. I think it's interesting. I'm very encouraged that they're bringing forth what could be actual hard evidence. These don't look like any ETs that I've heard about. So I'm I'm naturally skeptical of stuff like this, yeah. but yeah. I'm excited that they're talking about it. That's kind of yeah. where I'm at right now. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I'm kind of waiting to, I'm a little uh, on the skeptical side of it, but you know, let's keep the conversation out there about UFOs and aliens and you know, all of this because we need to keep talking about it, but we don't need um, anything um, coming in where it's going to damage all the good work that we've all done. You know, there's, there's a, yeah. See, I have, so, I have seen, the real thing, all right? And I have a broad vision of it. I've met many, many different types of ETs and I have a lot of information on me. So my opinions are gonna be very specific. And one of them is, is that there's so much misinformation out there and it's deliberate. And my opinion about this, the Mexican NASCA is that this is not okay. It's not real, it is misinformation. And I'm gonna bring up a point here you've given me the chance. Okay. I got the picture. I, the Nazca lines, they show you pictures of the Nazca lines and they don't show you all of them. They don't show you the actual views. Okay. Um, one of the things that I've described with ET, and I know you've heard this from people is when they bring the light down, there's an energy ribbon that comes down. Well, I made a point to Preston about two weeks ago. I said, look at the Nazca lines. I want to show you part of the Nazca lines and it shows and craft with the light and the energy ribbon coming down, okay? And so I brought it up. I don't know if you can see it or not. If it's totally bad, I'll send it to Preston. But there's the craft, there's the light, and there's the energy ribbon coming down. They tell the truth. In other words, everything that they've, every artifact that they've led, left behind historically is telling a truth. It's a total narrative from the beginning to the end of our historical periods and other historical periods. But the people who are reporting it are being shut down and not allowed to tell the total, total truth. And then that's a misinformation all by itself because you can't make up your mind at what you're looking at if you can't see the whole thing. If you go there to see it, you have to be in a bloody jet to get that exact picture yourself. Okay, this is not an airplane, a Cessna. This is a jet that went over. That's how high up you have to be to see it. Oh, wow. They knew when we made craft big enough to go over them properly that we would see this. This is information that our future generation was being shown to corroborate certain kinds of information to us, but they're not telling you the truth about it at it's all. It's like Egyptian hieroglyphs. There's messages there as well. So, so all, all no, right. my opinion is, no, it's not real. It's information. Right. Okay. Here, here is another question, which I'm glad is asked because I did not think to ask this. And I am curious. This comes from Starletta. And she's asking, is there a percentage of how many are contacted by greys or other beings? So I'm guessing, is she asking, you know, is it just greys you hear about? Or do you hear about, you know, human looking ETs and mantids? Those. Well, with my work, it's mainly the greys, the little ones that take the people out of their environment, bring them on the ship. But once they're on the ship, there's other of uh, beings that are working together. I mean, there's the tall gray beings, and then there's always a praying mantis type. Somewhere always, and he seems to be in charge. Um, yeah. As far as with my workload, there's a light beings sometimes that they see, um, the human looking ones, which we now feel they're the, you know, perfected hybrids. Um, and Every once in a while, and I, it's, I don't come across the reptilians very often, which is very interesting. Every once in a while, somebody they're will describe Earth. something. They've been on Earth oh, since the toilet. They've been on Earth since the dinosaurs. They're natural oh, to sure. this planet. They were here before sure. us, and they're intelligent beings. And uh, the governments of the world have found them, and uh, not letting you know about them at all. And you, well, some people here call them cryptids. But they're earthlings. Oh, they're, they're yeah. Here. Oh, yeah. So yeah. yeah, it's just mainly the you know the the short little greys and then the taller ones and the praying mantis are very very prominent in all my cases. Um, so 
I'm sure there are, you know, many others, but those are, I'm, I'm not coming across, uh, you know, other than what I just mentioned. And I think because I'm dealing with uh, cases that our people are being taken and, and uh, yeah. that's what exactly. I'm doing. All right. So here is another question, which is somewhat a statement. And Raul Melendez is asking, I've had dreams of seeing UFOs flying in clouds. It was so real. I could see every detail. I feel this was astral projection. What could be the significance of this? I know I wanted to be with them. So I guess the question to me would be, are dreams of UFOs uh, significant? And could this be a sign of contact? I think many times, yes, it could be a sign of contact that um, they they had an experience and it's, and it's coming forward in dreams. That's why when I work with people, I always tell them, uh, now that we've opened up subconscious, pay attention to your dreams, information will come that way, or in um, you know flashbacks. Uh, so, uh, I mean, there are many, many people, of course, uh, that are, you know, they want to find out the truth of what happened to them and, and what prompted them to is that they're having dreams about UFOs or having recurring dreams. Um, and, and, and which I, I find interesting that many of them have flying dreams. They've been having flying dreams since they were a child. So that could be another indication, uh -oh. but I have you know, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a reason, Preston, that you're doing all this. There's a reason. <laughs> yeah, I <think> so. <laughs> so, Yeah, so it's like, and I tell people, don't panic if you know you have a flying dream. It's it's several different symptoms together or signs yeah. that could point to an abduction. Now, when people come in, I never tell them, "Oh, you're an abductee." before I even start working with them, you know, because yeah. I can't do that. You know, I, I've got to let the information come forward. Can I, so I, can I ask you a question? Me. This is this is something that I feel very strongly about. I want to ask you this, okay? Um, I don't like the word abducted. It is oh, negative. Oh, a lot of people don't. Yeah. yeah. And uh, one of the things that I try to stress to everybody is you're not being abducted. Abducted means there's a ransom and that uh, you're being held against your will, okay? You're not. Uh, contact is absolutely what's happening. They're being contacted and sure. they're being brought on board, given a ride, checked out, healed a lot of times, and then brought home again. Uh, yeah. Nobody's, there are no horror stories with these unless you're my lab, and that's a whole other story. That's uh, a whole other. But some people, Dolly, I know and I can understand that they're angry. They're in that angry mode. Um, oh, yeah, I mean, um, a lot of people like that. Yep. Yep. This was done to me. I didn't give them, you know, permission. So they considered themselves an abductee, and I can't take that away from them. So when I'm no. lecturing, I don't know who's going to be the audience. So I say, okay, I'm going to use these terms interchangeably, you know, abductee and, and experiencer, and yeah. let them decide where they want, you know, where they want to be. If they want, you know, I, mean, I hate the labels, but we have to, you know, we have to talk about, you know, what's happening. But you know, I understand yeah. your point of view. Dolly, you know, and it's true, but, but like, I work with so it, many you know people. Why? It goes to the thing that you're indoctrinated from birth on this planet to fear everything. Okay. As a nurse, I'm telling yeah. you that I've had people saying human beings, nice as they can be, and try to attack me, bite me, spit on me, knock me in the brains because I'm trying to help them. They're wow. in total, abject, unbelievable fear. And that overrides any sensibility you have. It marks yeah, sure. your experience. Okay? People go to horror shows. They go to horror places where you could be scared to death in a house, a horror yeah. house. They are taught horror on TV by war, by by yeah. horrible movies about uh, yeah. being abducted and, you know. You're a big part of our society, yeah. for sure. Yeah, it is. And, oh, my and God. It is, yeah. It is my experience <laughs> as contactee somebody who is on board and sees all this all the time literally that um once you get them on board that's why we talk to them and try to walk them through what's happening to them we're not hurting you this you're free to roam around here ask us anything this yeah. is we yeah. want this to be a positive experience for you we want you to overcome your fear abductors don't do that 
Real abductors don't do oh, that. They yeah. tie you up, they gag you, they blindfold you, they beat you up, they do all kinds of horrible things to you because that's what we've been taught to believe. And then, and I mean, they, they totally freeze. They're unbelievable. Some people don't even breathe. I've had them come on board and they're literally holding their breath. And it's like, why? Take a breath, breathe. <gasps> You know, you know, and you know, but it's not until yeah, I think once they pass that fear, that's when they realize because they are told many times by the beings, we're not here to hurt you. You know, that's right. Not that we have find you. That's right. I almost always say that. (laughs) Don't have no fear. No harm will come to you. That's the most common thing I think they ever say. Honestly, number one, we're not here to hurt you. They do. Yeah. Yeah. So. But they got it's just getting past that fear because I've seen the most, tra- you know, traumatized people coming in to see me, and then know. Well, you know, once and they get like, past that fear, then it's you know, then it, you shine a light plus, on it, literally. You know? Yeah, I give them the suggestions that you know you're going to allow this information to come forward. Whatever happened to you, you're you know, came out of it, you're fine, and you know, so you you it's helping with giving them suggestions at the same time, and. Um, but you know, it's a process. It's a process. Yes, like, it is. Have to be patient. You know, we all have to be okay. patient with it. Um, but I've well, seen, my past, you know, yeah. I've seen the healing. So that's what's kept me in doing this because I feel like, okay, I'm I'm doing the right thing. You know, I am helping people. So I, you know, to get feedback right. is very helpful. Like you know, for any of us. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, we've got like ten more minutes before we're gonna have to close this up. So I want to squeeze in a few more questions okay. if I can. Okay. A big shout out to Doxy for the super sticker. Thank you so much. Truly appreciate that. And here is a question from W. Decker, who also gave a super chat. Thank you so much. W. Decker is asking, have you all ever heard of something like this? When I was three or four, I was found early in the morning by a neighbor outside, but all the doors and windows were locked. My mom was dumbfounded. I don't remember anything. Thank you. Oh, have I heard of that? <laughs> oh, yes. oh I've heard of that. Um, up until, you know, this this past week, um, I was at the, uh, where was I? At the contact in the desert. And two ladies came to me and they one of them said, I, was, I couldn't walk yet. I was in the crib. And my parents came in and, you know, to, to get me out of the crib and they found the baby out in the backyard. They had a creek back there, sitting there by herself. And I me, mean, it's like, how oh, did you yeah. explain something like that? And but I've I've heard I've had those cases too, where just the when the question came up, the child was outside with all the doors locked. How did they get out there? And they couldn't even reach the door. You know, the door handle. Yeah. So, yes, that's very. He had to break into the, He had to break into the house to get in. <laughs> He, you know, yeah. he was just, a, you know, I think he was 12. He's like, he broke yeah. back into yeah. his own house. Exactly. He yeah. uses that as a great big calling card for the family. They really do. I was uh, brought out of the house at two and a half. My mother was heavily pregnant. And they took me six miles from the house and went to a utotem uh, behind it in Miami off of Miller Road and dropped me off and told me to walk around to the front and tell the guy, let me, you know, call, you know. Who, you know, say your belly, and they'll give you a balloon, right? That's what they told me. Oh. And uh, my mother was insanely freaking out. They had to bring my dad from work. They put her in a car. They were looking for me all in the neighborhood. They had an APB out on me. Hours of looking for me, and they finally got the call from the police that the you told them to come get me. I was there. All I had on was under. I was only taking a nap. No marks on my feet. Nothing. I was dropped there by them. Do you okay? think that was intentional, Dolly? absolutely intentional they were trying to i think in a weird terrible way they were trying to get my mother to wake up okay she she was having a really hard time with it you know it totally brought attention to her that this is happening and she can't ignore it and she learned not to ignore it but she still was trying to convince me that i was out of my mind even though all this stuff was happening and uh, it was hard for her, really hard. I love my mother. I'm telling you, I love my mother. And it was, I watched her suffer for this and there was nothing I could do for her, you know, nothing. And, and, and when it's in the beginning of the show that I feel that the beings want, because they're aware of what I do 
and no harms come to me and you know i've been doing this for many years that they want people to be enlightened about what is exactly. going on. Yep. That, that's a yeah. strong feeling. <clears throat> it's right. a physical I've got a few more thing. questions. I want, I want to squeeze them in. Dolly, this one's for you. So uh, okay. All right. if we can keep it short, because I still want a few others. Brad Peanut is asking, Dolly, how would we know we are hybrids if we are? Thanks. Caps look so okay. aggressive. LOL. <laughs> I was informed of it when I was almost six years old. I was told I was a hybrid um, and I've had my DNA pulled. We've proven it. And since then, Preston has actually seen my DNA. Oh, and, uh, I would love to. That's, it. that's so interesting to me, Dolly, because that's what I yeah. said. I would need proof before I present yeah. somebody. Yeah, I don't, I don't say this lightly, and I'm just now starting to come out with it um, because I have to be careful. <laughs> I don't want just okay. anybody coming after me for this. She showed um, it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> like, wow, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, they don't recognize some of the DNA. They're like, well, this is not, you know, we don't. Human. <laughs> we don't I'm not human. It. I'm not included in this. It's like, oh, oh, look at that. And I knew it, but it's weird when you see it. And I've, I, they just asked me to pull DNA from me again because they're trying to figure out why. And uh, it's yeah, I noticed some contactees do have interesting <laughs> DNA. They're related to royal families, or they, yes. their, their DNA goes way back. It can be lots of Native American heritage, perhaps. Yeah. There's some interesting DNA connections for sure. Yeah. yeah, I got weird DNA. I also have, I'm related to every Native people on this planet. I have more ethnicities than you can check a stuff at. And look at me, okay? It's weird. Okay. I have physically changed a lot over the years because of that. So, okay. well, a couple of more questions that I think we have time for. And this one is from Tools, and he wants to know, are they try trying to scare us? Why? Surely they know the average person is powerless to change these things. So, yeah, people are getting messages about wars and nuclear proliferation, and they're just your average citizen. How are they supposed to deal with this? Um, knowledge is your best friend. Know all that is knowable and then proceed. That's a message directly from ET. The more you know and understand your situation in this world, you can make a decision for yourself how to proceed. It's about us healing ourselves, healing what we know, healing how we feel about each other. Heal yourself first. Then take on the day. In other words, so what? We have things happening to us. You can either participate or or run around in a circle and, and be wrenching in agony and angst, or you can face what you've got to face. And that we have a whole generations of people now that are really incapable of doing that because they don't know the truth. They haven't, they're not grounded and founded in knowledge like they should be. And it's hard to live in a world where you're constantly lied to. I mean, it's really hard. I mean, how do you know what's what? That all by itself can cause anxiety and fear, you know? And so, yeah, heal how you feel about things, heal what you know, move through it as quickly as you can, and use your abilities. Clean yourself up. Try. You can do it. I promise. Okay? okay. Wow. Okay. Well, we're getting to the last couple of minutes here. I want to give you a chance, Yvonne, to talk about your books again or anything upcoming that you want to share. I will pull uh, some of the images uh, of your books you here. Know, so just mainly... Everybody, I tell my audiences, you know, support us all with our books, buy our books, give them out as gifts so you can help us spread the word. Christmas is coming. Put them in the stockings. Uh, it's really, really important to keep talking about this because it is a reality and it's happening to millions of people. But uh, coming out and I, I will post on my um website when the chosen book will be coming out it's going to be very interesting for the general public to know that these are normal everyday people who are having these experiences and we have formed a community you know we have formed a group a close encounter resource organization and then of course we're going to come out with our documentary at some point also next year maybe at about the same time the book comes out so there's a lot happening and we just need to pay attention to what's going on around us. Uh, if anyone has any questions for me, just go on to my website 
You can email me from there. I have questionnaires you can fill out if you feel that you, you may have had these experiences and you're ready to explore them. And write me, ask any question. I'm, I try to get back to everybody the same day. So thank you so much for both of you for having me. This was very interesting. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm so thankful that you came on. We would love to have more chats with you in the future, if that would be possible. And um, we look forward to your return. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending the light day tonight. We especially love you all so much. You're, uh, we will keep answering questions as we always do in the chats. I Yvonne can look at them as well. And if you have questions for us, you might actually ha have time to talk back to you as well. We are coming to you live from New Orleans, Louisiana, at the United Public Radio Network at 107.7 FM and the UFO Paranormal Radio Network at 105.3 FM. Thank you. It's been lovely, everybody. Thank you bless, for coming. Bless, bless, everybody. Thank you. Love, love.